بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابته الطيبين الأكرمين. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. God extol our noble Lord and Master Muhammad, his family and his companions, and grant them perfect peace. قال الله تعالى كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس. وكلمة الناس في هذه الآية عامة فهي تفيد جميع الناس على مختلف أشكالهم وأنواعهم وأحوالهم المؤمن وغير المؤمن المطيع وغير المطيع وفسر الإمام البخاري مفهوم الناس في هذه الآية بهذا العموم فقال خير الناس للناس وجاء مثل ذلك عن كثير من علماء السلف والخلف أي أن أمة الإسلام ينبغي أن تكون خير الناس وأنفعهم وأرحمهم لجميع الناس God exalted be he says in the noble Quran You are the best community brought forth unto humankind In this verse the word humankind is broad, general, and all-embracing. It includes all human beings in their diverse forms, types, and conditions. It refers to both the believer and the non-believer. It refers to those who obey God, as well as those who do not obey Him. Imam al-Bukhari interprets the meaning of humankind in this verse in such terms of comprehensive generality. He says, you must be the best of all people to all people. Many Islamic scholars in the first and later generations have held the same view. They understood that we as the world community of Islam must constitute the best, the most beneficial, and the most merciful of all people to all people as a whole. وليست خيرية هذه الأمة مفخرة نباهي بها غيرنا ونتكبر بها عليهم وإنما هذه الخيرية أمانة كبرى ومسؤولية ثقيلة فالدنيا دار الخدمة والآخرة دار الأجرة وكانت هذه الخدمة العامة غير المقيدة دأب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل النبوة وعند النبوة وقالت له أم المؤمنين خديجة رضي الله عنها في بداية الوحي والله إنك لتصل الرحم وتصدق الحديث وتحمل الكل أي إنك تتحمل كل ثقيل في خدمة الغير وتكسب المعدومة أي إنك تعطي الناس الشيء المعدوم عندك وتوصله إليهم وتعين الفقير على الكسب وتقري الضيف وتعين على نوائب الحق Our status as the best community brought forth unto humankind is not a triumphalist boast. It is not a badge of arrogance that declares us superior to others. On the contrary, the excellent status God has given the Muslim community is a major trust we must keep and a weighty responsibility that we must bear. This world is a place of service, while the next world is the place of reward. General service to humanity in this world, without restriction, was the constant custom of the Messenger of God وسلم, before prophecy came and on the advent of its coming and all the time after that. Such service is the description that the mother of the believers, Khadija, God be pleased with her, gave of the Prophet وسلم, when the first revelation came. She said, in certainty, by God, you are a person who joins the tie of kinship. You speak the truth. You bear every great burden in serving others. You give freely to people. 
what you lack for yourself. You enable the poor to earn a living. You host your guests generously and you help others withstand the calamities of bad fortune. وَمِنْ آخِرِ مَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْوَحْيِ وِدَاعًا لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَتَعْظِيمًا لِشَأْنِهِ مَا جَاءَ فِي خَوَاتِيمِ سُورَةِ التَّوْبَةِ لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ وَالْخِطَابُ عَمٌّ فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ وقوله عنتم وقوله حريص عليكم بدليل التخصيص والاستثناء المفهومين من قوله تعالى بعد ذلك بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم فأفادت الآية أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أراد الخير لجميع الذين بعث إليهم السعيد منهم والشقي المطيع منهم والعاصي المقبل عليه بالصدق والمعرض عنه بالكذب فعز عليه عنة الجميع وليس المفلح فقط وكان حريصا عليهم جميعا مع خصوص الرأفة والرحمة بالمؤمنين منهم The second to the last verse of Surah At-Tawbah stands among the very last of the revelations sent down to the Messenger of God, God extol him and grant him perfect peace. It came down both as a final farewell to his community and as a universal declaration of his greatness. There has indeed come unto you a messenger from among your own. Troubled is he by what you suffer. He is concerned for you and your well-being. Unto the believers, he is kind and merciful. The people addressed in the statements, there has indeed come unto you what you suffer and concern for you and your well-being are all the people in general to whom the Prophet was sent, sallallahu alayhi wa The proof for this generality lies in the exception that is drawn at the end of the verse by the words, unto the believers, he is kind and merciful. In its entirety, this farewell verse indicates that at the end of his prophetic career, as at the beginning of it, the messenger of God, God extol him and grant him perfect peace, desired good for all humanity. This generality applies both to the felicitous among them and the infelicitous. It applies to those who obeyed and those who opposed him in falsehood. Likewise, the suffering of all these people troubled him immensely. He was not just troubled by the suffering of those who believed in him, followed him, and met with eternal success. Similarly, God's messenger, peace be upon him, was personally concerned for all humanity in its well-being and its well-being while showing special kindness and mercy for those among them who believed. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَيَجْعَلُ لَهُمُ الرَّحْمَانَ وُدَّا وَمِنْ تَفْسِيرِ ذَلِكَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يَضَعُ مَحَبَّةً خَاصَّةً فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الصَّادِقِينَ الصَّالِحِينَ وهذه المحبة تدل على صدق إيمانهم وإخلاصهم في العمل وهي المحبة التي أشار إليها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حيث قال لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه البخاري ومسلم وكلمة الأخ في لأخيه في الحديث بمعنى الأخ في الإنسانية من بني آدم عموما وليس الأخ في دين الإسلام فقط وجاء ذلك في شروح كثيرة وصرح رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بذلك المفهوم العام في رواية أخرى بسند جيد حيث قال 
لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب للناس ما يحب لنفسه وليست هذه المحبة مجرد الشعور بالتلطف في القلب نحو المحبوب وإنما هي إرادة جلب المنافع له ودفع المفاسد عنه والسعي في سبيل ذلك وعلى أساس ذلك عرف سلطان الأولياء شيخ الإسلام الشيخ عبد القادر الجيلاني مبدأ الإحسان في هذا الدين العظيم بأنه الصدق مع الحق وحسن الخلق مع الخلق God exalted be he says in the noble Quran Surely those who believe and perform righteous deeds for them shall the compassionate Lord ordain a special love one of the meanings of this verse is that God, exalted be He, shall place a special type of love in the hearts of the truthful and upright believers. This love will be a testimony to the truthfulness of their faith and the sincerity of their deeds. This special love is the one indicated by the messenger of God. God extol him, God extol him and grant him perfect peace when he said, none of you believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself, Bukhari and Muslim. The words for his brother in this hadith refer to each believer's brother or sister in humanity, among the children of Adam in general, and not just to his brother or sister in the religion of Islam. This explanation has been given in many commentaries on the hadith. God's messenger, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, also stated this general understanding explicitly in another hadith with an excellent chain of transmitters. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, none of you believes until he loves for humankind what he loves for himself. This love is not just made up of feelings of affection towards the ones we love. Rather, it requires that we exert ourselves to accomplish that. On this basis, the Sultan of the Awliya, Shaykh al-Islam, as Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, defined the principle of ihsan, moral perfection, in this religion as truthfulness towards God, the real and good character toward all his creation. وَقَالَ بَعْدُ الصَّالِحِينَ مَنْ أَحَبَّ اللَّهَ وَأَحَبَّ لِلَّهِ فَقَدْ تَمَّتْ لَهُ وِلَايَتُهُ ومن علامة هذه المحبة الرحمانية أيضا أنك تحب من أحسن إليك ومن لم يحسن إليك وهذه المحبة من أجل مقامات اليقين Some of the upright believers of this community have said Whoever loves God and loves others for the sake of God His or her sainthood has attained perfection one of the signs of this perfected love of, that God, the compassionate, confers upon us is that we love those who do good to us just as we love those who do not do good to us. Such a love belongs to the most illustrious nations of certainty of belief. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي شَأْنِ نَبِيِّهِ الْكَرِيمِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ وَالتَّنْكِيرُ كَلِمَةِ رَحْمَةً في الآية الكريمة يفيد أن الرحمة التي بعث بها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رحمة غير معهودة فهي فوق كل وصف God the Exalted says regarding the eminence of his noble prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we sent thee not save as a mercy unto the worlds. The use of the indefinite grammatical form in this verse in the words a mercy indicates in Arabic usage that the mercy that the Prophet peace be upon him was given and with which he was sent belonged to a unique type of mercy not customarily known to us. It was a mercy so special that it exceeded our ability to describe it. فَبُعِثَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ عَظِيمَةٍ جِدًّا 
مشتملة على جميع وجوه الرحمة الإلهية كي يكون الرسول رحمة لجميع الناس والخلق في كل مكان وزمان وكلمة العالمين عامة تعم كل ما يصدق عليه اسم العالم فهي تفيد جميع الناس وجميع الخلق فالآية لم لم تخص عالما دون عالم فلم يقول سبحانه وتعالى وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للمؤمنين خاصة فشملت هذه الرحمة النبوية العظيمة غير المعهودة المؤمنة وغير المؤمن والموحد وغير الموحد والمطيع وغير المطيع بل شملت كلمة العالمين الجمادات والنباتات والحيوانات وجميع الكون ومن مفهوم هذه الآية أن واجب الأمة أن تتخلق بخلق نبيها الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم وتتبعه فتكون هي الأخرى رحمة للعالمين وتجلب المصالح لجميع الناس ولجميع الخلق وتدرأ عنهم المفاسد The Prophet peace be upon him was sent with such an exceedingly great mercy that it included all the infinite aspects of divine mercy Thus the messenger came as a mercy to all humankind and to all creation and all created things in all times and places. The words unto the worlds are general and not restricted to any particular type of world. The verse includes everything to which the word world in Arabic, which is broader in this sense than English, can be validly applied. It refers, therefore, to all human beings and to all creation and all created things. The meaning of the verse does not restrict itself to one particular world as opposed to another. God, glorious and exalted be He, did not say, for example, we sent thee not save as a mercy to the believers or to your community in particular. Thus, this universal and uncustomary prophetic mercy which is beyond anything we know or have experienced, includes the believer as well as the disbeliever. It includes the person who believes in God's oneness and the person who does not. It includes the person who obeys as well as the person who disobeys. In fact, it even includes all that is in the universe, the minerals, the plants, the animal kingdoms, and everything. Therefore, part of what we must understand from this verse as believers is that it is our obligation as the world Muslim community to take on, to follow, and to live by the traits of the Prophet's character وسلم. Thus we too must strive to be a mercy unto the world. We must seek to bring benefits to all people and to all creation and must actively ward off harm from them. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما أنا رحمة مسدا فزين الله نبيه الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم للرحمة في جميع أقواله وأفعاله وشمائله ومن ذلك أنه لم يكن سبابا ولا لعانا جاء في صحيح مسلم أنه قيل يا رسول الله أدعو على المشركين قال إني لم أبعث لعانا وإنما بعثت رحمة وينبغي أن تكون أمته رحمة لجميع الناس أيضا فلا ينبغي أن نتعهد السب واللعنة والدعاء على الناس بل من الرحمة الإلهية أن ندعو من أن ندعو حتى لأعدائنا بالتوبة والهداية والصلاح بل هو من الحكمة أيضا فإننا كما قال بعض العلماء عندما ندعو على من عدانا وأساء إلينا فكأننا بذلك نطلب من الله تعالى أن, يسي أن يزيدهم شرا وعدوانا وتغيانا وإساءة إلينا 
ولعل بعض الكوارث التي نزلت بنا اليوم هي بسبب ما تعاوده بعض المسلمين من الدعاء على كل من عادانا ولا سيما بالمكبرات في المناسبات الدينية وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لأم المؤمنين عائشة رضي الله عنها يا عائشة إن الله رفيق يحب الرف ويعطي على الرفق ما لا يعطي على العنف وما لا يعطي على سواه The Prophet said, God extol him and grant him perfect peace. I am not but a special mercy freely bestowed as a gift by God. God adorned his noble Prophet, peace be upon him, with mercy in all the things he said, everything he did, and in each and every one of his perfect attributes. One aspect of this perfection of mercy is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, never had the habit of insulting or cursing others. It has been authentically transmitted in Muslim that it was once said to the Prophet وسلم, O Messenger of God, supplicate God against the idolaters. The Prophet replied, I was not sent as one who is given to cursing, rather I was sent as a mercy. It is to be expected that this world community of Islam of ours also be a great mercy to humankind. We should never make it our habit to speak abusively of others or to curse them, even our enemies, nor should we make supplications to God against them. On the contrary, it is part of the divine mercy which we are meant to embody that we make supplications to God for our enemies and ask Him to open their hearts to repentance, to give them guidance and to make them good and upright. This is also a token of wisdom as well, for as some great scholars have said, when we make supplications against those who are our enemies and have done us wrong, it is as if we were actually asking God, exalted be He, to increase the evil of our enemies, to increase their enmity against us, and to increase the transgressions and the harm that they do. Without doubt, many of the catastrophes that affect our community at this moment are because of the habit that some Muslims have adopted of making furious and fiery supplications against our enemies, especially over microphones on religious occasions. God's Messenger, peace be upon him, said to Aisha, mother of the believers, God be pleased with her, Aisha, God is truly gentle. He gives in return for gentleness what he does not give in return for harshness and what he does not give in return for anything else. وقال الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز وكذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكونوا شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا ومعنى ذلك أن أفراد هذه الأمة ينبغي أن يكونوا خيارا وعدولا كما كان الصحابة الكرام رضي الله عنهم والسلف الصالح خيار الناس وغاية في العدالة والوسط من الناس في كلام العرب هو الفاضل صاحب الخصال المحمودة لوقوعها بين طرفي الإفراط والتفريط ولذلك قيل خير الأمور أوساطها ووصف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بأنه كان وسطا في قومه أي أنه كان خيارهم خلقا وخلقا نسبا وحسبا ومن كل وجه فهذه الآية تفيد مثل ما أفاده قوله تعالى كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس God exalted be he says in the glorious Quran thus did we make you a middle community that you may be witnesses for humankind and that the messenger may be a witness for you. This means that each individual member of our community should strive to be among the very best and the most just of all people. We should be like the righteous companions, God be pleased with them, 
and the upright members of the first generations of Muslims who ranked among the very best of humankind in all times and were epitomes of goodness and justice. The word middle, when applied in Arabic usage to people, refers to those human beings who are the most excellent and have the most praiseworthy attributes. It implies that their excellence rests in the fact that they always fall in the middle between the two extremes of either going too far in excessiveness or not doing enough out of lack of concern or negligence. For this reason, it is also said in Arabic, the best of matters are those that belong to the middle. The messenger of God, God extol him and grant him perfect peace, was also described as being of the middle with regard to his people. This meant in Arabic that he was the very best of them in outward form and inward character. It implied that he had the best lineage among them and that he had earned and was worthy of the highest honor. It meant that he was the most excellent of them from every standpoint. Thus this verse conveys a meaning similar to that of the verse discussed at the beginning, you are the best community brought forth for humankind. ومن معاني قوله تعالى في الآية الكريمة لتكونوا شهداء على الناس أي لتكونوا قوامين للناس بالقسم بتنبيه الغافلين منهم إلى الصدق التوجه إلى الله وإلى الحق وإلى الخير ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا أي حفيظا لكم بإرشاده وحسن سيرته صلى الله عليه وسلم عن طرق الإفراط والتفريد. One of the meanings of this verse when it says, so that you may be witnesses for humankind, is that as Muslims we should be upholders of fairness and justice among ourselves and among all people. We must take the hand of the ignorant and the negligent and draw their attention to what will enable them to turn to God in truthfulness. We must guide them to the truth and what is good. As for the remainder of the verse, and so that the messenger may be a witness for you, it is said that it means so that the Prophet, peace be upon him, be a protector for you through your acceptance of his right guidance and his life example, so that you remain always in the middle and avoid the extremes of excess and negligence. وقيل إن معنى قوله تعالى لتكونوا شهداء على الناس ليحفظ الله بكم جميع الأمم فواجب المسلمين في الحفاظ على جميع الناس وإسداء الخير للعالمين بمثابة مقام القرآن العظيم في الحيمنة على الكتب السماوية السابقة والرسائل النبوية السالفة وأنزلنا إليك الكتاب بالحق مصدقا لما بين يديه من الكتاب ومهيمنا عليه فينبغي أن يكون المسلم هو الحل وليس المشكلة وبانحطاط المسلمين تخسل الدنيا بأسرها خسارة عظيمة It is also said that part of the meaning of so that you may be witnesses for humankind is so that God make you a protection for all other human communities. Thus, it is an obligation for Muslims to seek to bring about the protection and well-being of all people and to do good to them, just as it is the nature of the Quranic revelation to be a protector over all the heavenly books that preceded it and the prophetic dispensations that came before it. God says in the Quran, and we have sent down unto thee the book in truth, confirming the revelation that came before it, and as a protector of it. Thus, a Muslim is always meant to be the solution and never the problem. By virtue of our decline as a middle community, we and all the world around us have indeed taken a great loss. ومن معاني هذه الآيات وغيره من الأدلة أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أهل أمته 
لتكون رحمة للعالمين وأمة وسطا وخير أمة أخرجت للناس فقد هدانا لكل ما نحتاج إليه لنكون بهذه الأمانة فباتباع هديه والتخلق بخلقه أصبحنا خير الناس لجميع الناس قال البوسيري لما دعا الله داعينا لطاعته بأكرم الرسل كنا أكرم الأمم Among the meanings of these and similar verses in the Quran and statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is that they indicate that God's Prophet, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, fully taught us and prepared us as his community to be a special mercy to the world like himself and to constitute a middle community. It is by the blessing of following in the Prophet's footsteps that we become the best of all communities brought forth for humankind. The Prophet guided us to everything we need for that purpose so that we may keep the trust that was given us. For this reason, we can only hope to become the best of all human communities to the degree that we take on the Prophet's good character and follow his eternal example. Imam al Busayri says, and when God called the Prophet, who in turn called us to God's obedience as the best of all messengers, we became the best of all communities. وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِسِيرَتِهِ الْحَكِيمَةِ وَسُنَّتِهِ الْكَرِيمَةِ الْحَلَّ لِكُلِّ مُشْكِلَةِ وَأَمْثِلَةُ ذَلِكَ كَثِيرَةٌ جِدًّا منها أن المؤمنين من بني أوس والخزرج رضي الله عنهم دعوا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى الهجرة وهم يطلبون حلا للحرب الأهلية التي قامت أجيالا بينهم وبين حلفائهم من اليهود حتى بلغت أقصى شدتها بحرب البعاث وحقق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هذه المعجزة السياسية بعد قدومه إلى المدينة بوضع الدستور المشهور بينهم المعروف بالصحيفة والميثاق وتتابعت معجزات سيرته الحكيمة صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى تم ذلك في آخر أيامه بتوحيد القبائل العربية لأول مرة في التاريخ ووضع أسس الخلافة الراشدة By virtue of his wise conduct in life and his noble pattern of behavior the messenger of God, God extol him and grant him perfect peace was in fact the solution to every problem Examples of this reality are many among them is the fact that the believers from the Medanese tribes of Al-Khazraj and Aus, the helpers, may God be pleased with them, invited God's messenger, please, peace be upon him, to make the hijrah, the migration to Medina, because they were urgently in need of a solution for the endemic civil war that had plagued their large oasis settlement for generations. The civil war had engulfed not only their two tribes, but also their allies among the various Jewish tribes of Medina. The civil war culminated in the bloody battle of Bu'ath only a few years before the Prophet's coming to Medina. The messenger of God, God extol him and grant him perfect peace, brought this political miracle to realization immediately after his arrival in Medina by laying down the well-known constitution between the tribes and clans of the city, which is known to scholars as the Constitution of Medina, an authentic document. In Arabic, as sahifa the scroll, and al mithaq the covenant. The Prophet's miraculous solutions to problems, peace be upon him, continue and followed one upon the other until at the end of his days on earth, he had brought about the unification of all the Arab tribes for the first time in history and laid the foundation for the rightly guided caliphate that would succeed him. وَأَدَّتِ الْحَضَارَةُ الْإِسْلَامِيَةُ دَوْرَ الْإِسْلَاحِ وَتَقْدِيمَ الْخَيْرِ لِجَمِيعِ النَّاسِ فِي أَجَلِّ عُسُورِهَا وَرُبَّمَا جَاءَتْ بِحُلُولٍ عَجِيبَةٍ 
لمعضلات المجتمعات التي لم يقدر على حلها غير المسلمين وكانت هذه الحلول من أهم أسباب انتشار انتشار الدعوة وقبول الناس للمسلمين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها ونذكر من أمثال ذلك إلغاء نظام الإقطاعية في الأندلس وصقيلية وجزر البحر الأبيض المتوسط بتطبيق الحكم الشرعي الحكيم من أحيا أرضا مواتا فهي له الذي حرر الفلاحين النصارى وغيرهم وكان من أكبر أسباب ازدهار المسلمين الاقتصادي والزراعي في صدر الإسلام وثورتهم الزراعية المشهورة During its illustrious ages Global Islamic civilization played the role of a middle community among the world's nations. It often produced solutions and set things right among different peoples, bringing lasting good to humanity. Muslims often provided remarkable solutions for social, economic, and cultural problems that other peoples had been unable to bring about on their own. The solutions Muslims produced came to be among the most important reasons for the worldwide spread of Islam and the wide acceptance of Muslims as neighbors in the East and the West and other regions of the world. An example of this is the ab abolition of the feudal system in Muslim Spain and Portugal, Al-Andalus in Muslim Sicily and other islands of the Mediterranean. One of the policies that facilitated the abolition of feudalism in Muslim Europe was application of the prophetic teaching. Whoever brings unused land to life owns it. This ruling applied to vast stretches of fallow, feudal land. It served not only Muslims, but it liberated the Christian peasantry and other populations as well. This uncomplicated, distribution of empty land was one of the greatest reasons behind the great agricultural revolution and global economic prosperity that were hallmarks of Islamic civilization. وَمِنْ أَمْثِلَةِ ذَلِكَ الْخَيْرِ الْعَامِ الَّذِي قَدَّمُهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ الْقُرَى التِّجَارِيَةُ الْمُشْتَرَكَةُ الَّتِي أَقَامَهَا الْمُسْلِمُونَ فِي غَرْبِ إِفْرِقِيَا فِي وَقْتٍ مُبَكِّرٍ كما بين ذلك المؤرخ جون رالف ويلس فهذه القرى التجارية المتميزة أمكنت المسلمين من تحمل الخسائر الاقتصادية والاستمرار بالتجارة العالمية رغم الظروف الصعبة التي واجهتهم في غرب إفريقيا حتى حولوا المنطقة كلها إلى سوق دولية خسبة وأحدث أحدث وسائل الاتصال بين جميع نواحي المنطقة المباركة والعالم الخارجي فوضع الأسس الاقتصادية والثقافية التي قامت عليها كل من مملكة غانا في آخر قرونها ثم مملكة مالي التي كانت من أغنى وأقوى دول العالم في أيام الملك المشهور منسى كان كان موسى في القرن الرابع عشر الميلادي ثم بعد ذلك مملكة سونغهاي. Another example of the great general good that Islam as a middle community produced for the world were the trading village cooperatives that the Muslims established in West Africa and from an early time as has been shown by the historian John Ralph Willis. These unique trading village cooperatives enabled Muslim artisans, farmers, traders, merchants, and others to withstand the economic difficulties, dangers, and burdens that the ancient tribal order of West Africa imposed upon them prior to the region's unification as a single organic economic system under Muslim leadership. The village cooperatives ultimately served to connect West Africans to the markets of the greater Islamic world beyond and enabled them to become active partners in world trade. After several generations, these Muslim trading village cooperatives 
develop a new economic infrastructure in West Africa and converted the region into a rich international market. These developments also led to the creation of new means of communication and travel in West Africa that were connected to the global trade routes beyond. Ultimately, this led to the most glorious days of the empire of Ghana. It laid down the foundations of the great empire of Mali, which succeeded Ghana and became one of the richest and most powerful nations on earth, especially under its celebrated king Mansa Kankan Musa in the fourth century of the Common Era. It was on this same economic and cultural foundation that the empire of Songhai was based, which appeared in the wake of the empire of Mali. وفي القرنين الثالث والرابع عشر الميلاديين اشترك المسلمون في وضع نظام اقتصادي عالمي فعال بالتعاون مع الصين كما بينت ذلك المؤرخة جانت لبمن أبو لغة فوضعوا ونظموا الأسواق العالمية من أقصى المشرق في الصين إلى أقصى المغرب في الأندلس وأوروبا الشرقية والغربية وغرب إفريقيا وجاء هذا النظام الجديد بأقدم نماذج للبنوك الدولية ونقل الأموال الضخمة عبر القارات عن طريقة الكوالة وما يشبه الشيكات من غير حمل الذهب والفضة ولكن من نوائب الحق في القدر أن هذا النظام الاقتصادي العالمي العجيب النافع انهار في القرن الرابع عشر الميلادي بغتة انهيارا تاما بسبب انتشار الطاعون العالمي المعروف في التاريخ بالموت الأسود لكن هذا النظام وضع الأسس التي قام عليها نظام البنوك والرأس مالية الغربية بتعديلاتها الضارة في القرن الخامس عشر وما بعد ذلك. During the 13th and 14th centuries of the Common Era, Muslims made a partnership with Imperial China that laid down the foundations of a dynamic global economic system such as the world had never seen before as has been illustrated by the historian Janet Lipman Abu Nur. This system connected and rationally organized a vast series of international markets stretching from China in the Far East to the furthest reaches of Europe and Africa in the West. In collaboration with the Chinese, Muslims produced the oldest known models for what would become the bank and the international banking system of the modern era. The new economic order facilitated the movement of large amounts of capital across vast continents and seas by way of promissory money orders, the hawala transaction, that were similar to modern checks. These promissory notes relieved merchants from the onus and grave danger of carrying large and heavy amounts of gold and silver with them on their international travels. But as a fearsome vicissitude of God's will in history, this remarkable global economic order completely collapsed and came to a sudden and unexpected end during the 14th century of the Common Era because of the rapid spread of the global plague of that century known in history as the Black Death the bubonic plague. Never, nevertheless, this relatively short-lived economic system of two centuries laid the foundations for the Western capitalist banking system, although it is not responsible for some of the harmful and usurious alterations that Europe would introduce during the 15th and subsequent centuries as it revived and modified that system of which it too had been a beneficiary. والخير الذي قدمه المسلمون للعالم بمختلف العلوم والصناعات معروف ومعترف به ومن أهم عناصر ذلك الخير العام صناعة الورق بطريقة رخيصة نسبيا التي امتدت من مدينة بخارة إلى الغرب وغيره 
والتي أدت إلى ظهور حضارة الكتاب ومحو الأمية في بعض الأحيان والمناطق وتبلور علم الرياضيات بين المسلمين عدة قرون آخذين من مصادر كثيرة مختلفة يونانية وهندوسية وفارسية وغيرها حتى قدموا الأرقام العربية إلى العالم ومفهوم الصفر وغير ذلك ولولا هذه الهدايا العالمية القيمة لظل أكثر وجوه التقدم التكنولوجي التي نعرفها ونستفيد منها اليوم الحاسب الآلي والجوال وغيرهما من محض المستحيل The immense benefits that Muslims introduced to the world in arts and crafts, various technologies and the empirical sciences are well known and studied and universally recognized by historians. Among the most basic yet important of these gifts to humanity was the development of relatively inexpensive techniques for the manufacture of paper, which occurred in the Muslim city of Bukhara in Central Asia, borrowing but modifying Chinese techniques, which then spread to other regions of the world. The manufacture of inexpensive paper helped erase illiteracy, fostered the rise of illiterate civilization, and ushered in a much greater access to books than had ever been the case in the ancient past. Muslims had a special love for the mathematical sciences, which they systematized and synthesized from diverse ancient sources, Greek, Indian, Persian, and others. Among their many other mathematical achievements, Muslims offered Arabic numerals to the world, which included the revolutionary concept of zero. Had it not been for the gift of Arabic numerals and the concept of zero that underlies them, most, if not all, of the technological progress, including the computer and cell phone, which we rely upon today, would have been virtually impossible. ومن المعلوم أن من أبرز سمات الحضارة الإسلامية حيث وجدت أنها فتحت أبواب التعايش بين الناس رغم اختلاف الأديان والأجناس واللغات وأنها شجعت التبادلات الثقافية والعلمية الفعالة وعرف المسلمون بالدفاع عن الأقليات الدينية التي عاشت بين أيديهم ومن أحسن الدراسات العلمية الحديثة بهذه الظاهرة المتميزة كتاب The Arts of Intimacy فنون التآنس التي ألفته العالمات جيرالد and Dodd, Maria Manukal and Abigail Balbali إن الكتاب دراسة جميلة بصور صور كثيرة لظاهرة التبادل الثقافي الفني الفعال الذي قام في مدينة تغيطلة الأندلسية بين المسلمين واليهود والنصارى المستعربين ظهر الكتاب في سنة 2009 وحاز شرف أحسن كتاب ظهر في تلك السنة من قبيل جريدة The Times في لندن. One of the essential characteristics of classical Islamic civilization, wherever it flourished, as is well established in history, was that it opened the door for all people in its realms to live together and cooperate harmoniously despite their religious cultural, ethnic, and linguistic differences. Islamic civilization encouraged dynamic cultural and scientific exchanges. Muslims did not just tolerate different religious communities and minorities that lived among them. Muslims also protected those communities from their enemies and allowed them to flourish in their midst. Among the most recent academic studies of this unique Islamic cultural phenomenon is the book The Arts of Intimacy, written by Geraldine Dodd, Maria Menokal, and Abigail, Abigail Balbali. It is a beautiful study filled with many photographs. The book brings to light the remarkable phenomenon of the creative cultural and artistic exchanges that took place between Muslims, Jews, and Christians in the Andalusian city of Toledo in Muslim Spain. 
The book appeared in 2009 and won the honor of being designated by the London Times Review of Books as the best book published that year. وَأَمَّا فِي مَجَالِ التَّعْلِيمِ فَقَدْ أَثْبَتَ الْبَاحِثُ الْمَشْهُورُ جورج مَقْدِسِي قَبْلَ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ ثَلَاثِينَ سَنَةً بِكِتَابِهِ الْأَكَدَمِيَّ الْمُتْقَنْ The Rise of Colleges ظهور المدارس العليا في الإسلام والغرب أن الجامعات الغربية أن الجامعات الغربية المشهورة التي ظهرت في أوروبا في آخر العصور الوسطى لم تكن ظاهرة ثقافية مستقلة بل تأثرت إلى حد بعيد للمدارس العليا في الإسلام التي سبقتها ولا سيما المدارس الخاصة بإخراج الفقهاء والمفتين والمجتهدين ومن آثار هذه المدارس على الجامعات الأوروبية الناشئة كما أثبت المقدسي مبادئ أساسية كحرية البحث والكتابة وكذلك تقديم الأطروحة في مجال علمي مبتكر جديد ثم الدفاع عن عنها أمام العلماء وشهادة الدكتوراه التي تنال بذلك والنظام المعروف بالكرسي الجامعي المنتشر في الغرب مأخوذ من كراسي التعليم في العالم الإسلامي. As for education, the famous academic researcher George Mukdesi showed more than 30 years ago in his carefully documented academic work the rise of colleges, which is about which is about the appearance of schools of higher education in the Islamic world and the medieval West, that the most famous Western universities that appeared in Europe at the end of the Middle Ages were not an independent cultural phenomenon. Rather, these Western universities were influenced deeply and in great detail by the schools of higher learning that preceded them in the Islamic world, especially the legal colleges, Madaris, that were designed to produce authorized scholars of Islamic law, fuqaha, juris councils, muftis, and independent mujtahids. Among the vestiges of these legal colleges in the developing universities of Europe, as Maqdisi has shown, were the affirmation of fundamental principles such as academic freedom, the institution of writing the doctoral dissertation in an original area of study, the subsequent defense of the dissertation before a committee of qualified scholarly peers, and even the PhD degree itself, which, um, which the graduate student attained through such labors. The tradition known as the university chair, which spread throughout the West, was also taken from the lecture chairs that were established earlier in Islamic colleges and remain in some of the Muslim countries until today. ثم أثبت الأستاذ المقدسي في كتابه The Rise of Humanism ظهور الإنسانية أن الفلسفة المعروفة بالغرب للإنسانية والتي كانت من أهم عناصر النهضة الأوروبية والتي ربما يفتخر بها الغرب اليوم أكثر من أي مبدأ آخر ويرى أنها من مزاياه الخاصة فلها أيضا جذور عميقة تعود إلى الحضارة الإسلامية ولا سيما إلى حلقات الأدباء والأطباء العلمية ومن أدلة هذا التأثير ما كتبه بيكو دي لا ميراندولا في أول كتابه المشهور شرف الإنسان الذي ألف في القرن الخامس عشر الميلادي وكان بيكو من أهم قادة النهضة المعروفة وكان على علم للغات اللاتينية واليونانية والعبرية والآرامية والعربية وكان أستاذه من المتمكنين من فلسفة ابن رشد وقال بيكو في افتتاح هذا الكتاب المذكور المشهور المهم الذي يعرف في الغرب ببيان النهضة وهو يخاطب آباء الكنيسة <تصفيق> قال 
لقد قرأت أيها الآباء المحترمون بكتب العربي أن عبد الله العربي يريد بذلك عبد الله ابن كتيبة سئل ما هو أجدل شيء بالعجب على مسرحية العالم كما يقال فأجاب أنه ليس ثمة شيء يرى هو أعجب من الإنسان In a subsequent, subsequent work, The Rise of Humanism, George Makdisi documented in detail that even the philosophy of man, known in the West as humanism, has deep roots that go back to Islamic civilization, especially to the academic circles of the chancellery scribes and literary figures at Udabat. Humanism came to constitute the presiding value system of the European Renaissance. It remains to this day the hallmark of Western ethics. Many Westerners take more pride in humanism than they do in anything else Western, and they generally regard it to be a unique Western accomplishment. Among the many proofs in his book, Makdisi reminds us of the famous words of Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who opens his early Renaissance essay, The Dignity of Man, which is called the Manifesto of the Renaissance, by addressing a body of Catholic clergy and saying, I have read, Reverend Fathers, in the works of the Arabs, that when Abdullah the Saracen was asked what he regarded as most to be wondered at on the world stage, so to speak, he answered that there was nothing to be seen more wonderful than man. Pico was among the most important figures of the early Renaissance. He learned Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. His primary teacher was steeped in the Aristotelian philosophy of Averroes. Abdullah the Saracen is probably a reference to Abdullah ibn Qutaybah, the famous Islamic humanist who wrote a book on the dignity of man centuries before Pico. وَخِتَامًا لِهَذَا الْبَحْثِ فَقَدْ قَالَ ابْنُ عَطَاءِ اللَّهِ الْبِدَايَاتُ مَجَّلَاتُ النِّهَايَاتِ وَقَالَ مَنْ أَشْرَقَتْ بِدَايَتُهُ أشرقت نهايته وكانت بدايات هذه الأمة الفاضلة عظيمة مشرقة جدا ودامت هكذا أكثر من ألف سنة فبشرت بنهايات طيبة متماثلة وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أمتي أمة مرحومة وقال أمتي كالمطر لا يدرى أوله خير أو آخره فلا بد من أن ينتظر الخير والخيرية هذه الأمة المرحومة في آخرها كما ثبت ذلك لها في أوائلها In conclusion, Ibn Allah says the beginnings are the manifestations of the ends. He also says whoever has a luminous beginning will have a luminous end. The beginnings of this excellent middle community of Islam are truly great and luminous. They remain that way for more than a thousand years. Islam is a success story. It is not a failure. These great and luminous beginnings give us the good news and the great that in the end of time, greatness will again return to this ummah. The Messenger of God, God extol him and grant him perfect peace, said, My community is a community that will be shown mercy. He also said, My community is like the life-giving rain. It will, be, it will not be known which of it was better, the first of it or the last of it. Thus it must be the great good awaits our global community, which God will ultimately show special mercy in its end times, just as it was the case in its first times. وَإِنَّمَا كَانَ الْبَلَاءُ الشَّدِيدُ لِهَذِي الْأُمَّةِ فِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ الْمَاضِيَّيْنِ بِخَاصَّةٍ عَصْرِ الْإِسْتِعْمَارِ وَمَا بَعْدِ الْإِسْتِعْمَارِ وَابْتُلِيَتِ الْأُمَّةُ لِكُلِّ أَنْوَاعِ الْبَلَايَ وَالْرَزَايَ مِمَّا كَادَ أَنْ يُنْسِيَهَا نَفْسَهَا وَتُرَاثَهَا وَفَضْلَهَا وَكُلَّ الْخَيْرَ الَّذِي كَانَ مُتَدَّاوِلًا بَيْنَهَا وكان هذا البلاء من موجبات حكمة الله تعالى وعدله في القضاء والقدر فإنه كان من لوازم الحق 
أن تبتلى هذه الأمة الكريمة بمثل ما ابتليت به الأمم من قبلها بل كان لابد أن يكون هذا البلاء الشد لخيرية هذه الأمة بين الأمم حتى يكون انبعاثها وعودتها إلى الحق والخير بعد الفساد العام من أكبر معجزات رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في آخر الزمان قال الشيخ عبد القادر الجيلاني لا تهربوا من البلاء فإن البلاء مع الصبر أساس كل خير أساس النبوة والرسالة والمعرفة والمحبة Many of the greatest calamities that have overtaken this community have occurred during the last two centuries, the age of colonialism and post-colonialism. During this time, the global community of Islam was afflicted with every type of catastrophe and disaster to the extent that our community forgot itself, forgot its tradition, forgot its past and its excellence and all the good that had once been a common part of it. This affliction was part of the dictates of God's eternal wisdom, exalted be he, and also reflects his justice and the measure of his decree and providential destiny. For it is one of the demands of truth and justice that our religious community be afflicted with tests similar to those that God willed to afflict afflict upon the religious communities that were before us. Indeed, it was even proper that our affliction should be greater than theirs because of the special status this middle community enjoys among all other nations as the best community brought forth for humankind. Thus, the renewal of our community and its return to truth and goodness after the general corruption that have afflicted it will prove to be among the great miracles of God's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani said, Do not flee from affliction, for affliction in conjunction with patience is the foundation of all good. It is the foundation of prophecy and messengerhood and the true knowledge of God and the love of God. تاريخ الحضارة الإسلامية من أعظم عجائب هذه الأمة قال المرحوم الشيخ أبو زهرة إنما التجديد هو أن يعاد إلى هذا الدين رونقه ويزال عنه ما علق به من الأوهام ويبين للناس صافيا كجوهره نقيا كأصله وكان الزمن الذي عاش فيه الشيخ عبد القادر الجيلاني وهو عصر الحروب الصليبية كثير الشبه بما يواجهه المسلمون اليوم وكان الشيخ عبد القادر الجيلاني من أكبر أسباب الإصلاح والتجديد في هذا الجيل الذي عاش فيه حتى قيل إنه لم يظهر في الإسلام بعد الخلافة الراشدة من أصلح هذه الأمة كما أصلحها الشيخ عبد القادر الجيلاني في زمنه فقد ضبط أمر العلماء والمدارس وأصلح الصوفية ونظم سفوفه وفتح أبواب نهضة أهل السنة والجماعة الكبرى وأخذ بيد الملكين العظيمين عماد الدين زنجي وابنه نور الدين وقام بتربية الشاب الفتى صلاح الدين الأيوبي وجملة المجاهدين وبشر الشيخ عبد القادر مريده صلاح الدين بمستقبل كريم ودعا له بالتوفيق والحماية العجيبة من أعدائه فجاء الخير بعد الشر العميم وظهرت أسباب الرجاء بعد اليأس والعبرة من هذا الكلام هي أن نحرص على أن يعرف الناس أن اليأس غير مقبول شرعا لأن حكمة الله بالغة ورحمته واسعة قال الله تعالى وإن مسه الشر فيأوس قنود وقال سبحانه وتعالى قال ومن يقنة من رحمة ربه إلا الضالون فلا بد أن نستعمل الأسباب السياسية والإعلامية وغيرها لبعث الأمل في المسلمين 
ودفع الياس والانهيار النفسي عن قبولهم Among the greatest wonders of our world community of Islam are its repeated renewals throughout the history of its civilization. In defining the phenomenon of renewal, the late Azhari Sheikh Muhammad Abu Zahma said, renewal is simply that this religion be given back its true splendor once again, that all of the false illusions that have been appended to it be removed, and that it be displayed to the people again in its purity, just like its true essence and unsisted and unstained like its original foundation. In the time in which Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani lived, which was the time of the Crusades, we find that that time is remarkably similar to this time that faces Muslims today. Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani was among the greatest reasons for that renewal and rectification of his generation. His work was so great that it has been said that never did there appear in the history of Islam after the rightly guided caliphs a person who set the Islamic community aright more effectively than Sheikh Abdul Qadir in his time. He brought order and sincerity to the ranks of the scholarly community and their schools. He disciplined the Sufis and set them right and organized their ranks. He laid the foundations of the great Sunni Renaissance he guided the two great Mujahid kings, Imad al-Din and his son Nur al-Din Zengi. He personally raised and supervised Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi from his youth and directed the jihad movement against the Crusaders. He gave Salah al-Din good news of an illustrious future in store for him and asked God to give Salah al-Din ultimate success and protect him miraculously from his enemies. Ultimately, great good came again to this community after the general evil that had encompassed it. And there appeared real reasons for hope after a long period of darkness and despair. The objective of our saying this is that we all must endeavor to make our people understand that according to the prophetic law, despair is not acceptable. God's wisdom is all-encompassing and His mercy is vast. God exalted be He says, Man wearies not of supplicating for good, and if evil befalls him, he is despondent and despairing. God also says, Who, who despairs of the mercy of His Lord, save those who are astray? Therefore, we must use all means available to us through policy and the media and other things to spread hope among the Muslims and remove depression and despair from their hearts. قال الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز وسارعوا إلى مغفرة من ربكم وجنة عرضها السماوات والأرض وعدة للمتقين وهذه المسابقة تستوجب العلم والعمل والتواضع والإثارة والصدق مع الحق وحسن الخلق مع الخلق فالعمل يحتاج إلى العلم والعلم يحتاج إلى التوفيق وإلى العمل وقليل من الأدب خير من كثير من العلم من غير أدب وروي عن السلف الصالح من عمل بما علم ورثه الله علم ما لم يعلم ووفقه فيما يعمل حتى يستوجب الجنة ومن لم يعمل بما يعلم تاه فيما يعلم ولم يوفق فيما يعمل حتى يستوجب النار كذلك قيل إن العلم لا يهمل صاحبه بل يهلكه هلاك الأبد إن لم يعمل به ويحييه حياة السعادة الأبدية إن عمل بها به ومن خير وجوه العلم والعمل وأصدقها عند الله تعالى إسداء الخير بالخدمة والمحبة على منهج رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم للعالمين. In conclusion, as we end now, God says in His noble book, and hasten unto forgiveness from your Lord and for a garden whose breath is the heavens and the earth, prepared for the reverend. This spiritual hastening requires of us knowledge and practice, humility and the preference of others over ourselves. 
It requires of us to be truthful with God, the real, and to have good character with his creation. Practice requires knowledge, and knowledge requires practice and divine facilitation to feel. A little bit of good courtesy, adab, is better than much knowledge without courtesy. It is transmitted from the upright among the first generations of Islam. Whoever puts into practice what he knows, God will give him as an inheritance the knowledge of what he does not know. God will give him divine facilitation to feel in what he does so that he earns the garden. And whoever does not practice the knowledge that he knows will be deluded in what he does know. He will not be given divine facilitation in what he does so that he earns the fire. It is also said, knowledge does not overlook the one who possesses it. Rather, it either destroys him with an eternal destruction if he does not practice it, or it gives him eternal life and infinite felicity if he puts it into practice. Among the best types of knowledge and practice, and the most truthful of them all in God's presence, exalted be he, is that we as Muslims seek to do good to all others by way of service and love, according to the pattern of behavior established by God's Messenger, the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma bika nasta'inu fa'a'inna, wa bika nasta'idhu fa'a'ithna, wa alayka tawakkalna fa'kthina, يا كافي مهمات فينا أمور الدنيا والآخرة وبالي في هذا البلد الطيب وفي رئيسه وفي شعبه وفي جميع هذه المنطقة الكريمة وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم